Good evening. This is the news tonight, your daily roundup of all that has happened across India and the world. I'm Ashan Russell. And tonight, of course, our focus is on what President Pranam Mukherjee had to say, his New Year's message, while he was speaking to uh, students at uh, various IITs across the country through video conferencing, was a message to Parliament. Yes, both to the government and to the opposition to sort out their differences. What exactly was that message and what kind of uh, an impact that would have on parliamentary proceedings in the upcoming budget session? We'll be talking about that a little later later in the show, but first the headlines we're tracking right now. President Pranab Mukherjee sounds note of caution, says both ordinances and disruptions have a limited role in parliamentary democracy. In the run-up to presenting the union budget, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley says there's need to rationalise all subsidies, ensure stability in policies to attract investment. On a day when former UPA minister Krishna Thirath joins the BJP, its parliamentary board debates names of candidates for the Delhi Assembly elections. And on day one of the Australian Open in Melbourne, Anna Ivanovic is uh, the highest ranked first loser uh, of this tournament. Top seeds are Federer, Nadal and Sharapova though at once. All right, our top story tonight, Prime Minister Narendra Modi headed the meeting of the BJP Central Election Committee today to pick candidates for the forthcoming Delhi Assembly elections. Now, according to sources, uh, sitting MLA Jagdish Mukhi is likely to be sacrificed. Kiran Bedi, whose prominence since joining reportedly caused rumblings within the party, is unlikely to take on uh, our Malvi party chief Arvind Kejriwal from the New Delhi seat. She is likely to be fielded from Malvya Nagar. The task to counter Kejriwal is likely to be given to Shazia Ilmi. The BJP is likely to give tickets to all four new joiners, including Krishna Tirath, who was inducted earlier today. Vinod Kumar Bini is likely to contest against uh, Amalvi Party's Manish Sodia from Paparganj. And a correspondent, Shamsun, that has been tracking all these developments in the BJP and is uh, still uh, outside the BJP headquarters right now. So we'll go across to him. Uh, Sham, the meeting's still on over there. A lot of deliberations for the BJP and uh, a lot to manage because given the fact that so many new people have come into the party, uh, a lot of uh, the old uh, war horses for the BJP would be wary. Well, Ishan, as of now, what we know is that a state uh, unit of BJP has forwarded all uh, sitting M uh, MLA's na uh, name, but, uh, uh, you know, they, there are uh, two or three uh, MLA's uh, uh, on, uh, on those names. There are doubts whether they will get tickets or not in these uh, uh, elections. And one of the name is Mr. Jagdish Mukhi. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are two, uh, two three reasons. Because one, one is that age is not on his side. Uh, he is... Uh, 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 he's uh, uh, around 70 years old and uh, then uh, his son-in-law uh, is a candidate of uh, Congress from uh, Janakpuri seat uh, from where he is uh, contesting uh, uh, election for all these years and winning uh, uh, that seat. So this time his son-in-law is a uh, uh, Congress candidate so he may not. Uh, 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 so there are two, three reasons uh, uh, the, the uh, party doesn't want to, you know, uh, may not uh, give him a ticket this time. And then there is another thing that uh, uh, party party may not put uh, the, uh, Kiran Bedi against uh, Kejriwal and their, uh, the reason is because the party doesn't want that she is trapped in New Delhi constituency only because party uh, want, uh, wants to uh, uh, use uh, Kiran Bedi in, in, in uh, other constituencies also. They, they want to uh, uh, project her as, as the face of BJP. So if they put uh, her against Kejriwal, then she has to devote more time to New Delhi constituency and so there are chances that uh, she is not uh, put against uh, Mr. Kejriwal. All right, Sham, but that uh, really upsets uh, a lot of the equations for the older lot of the BJP who perhaps have been working for longer, given the fact that even Shazia Ilmi or Kirshna Tirath, the fact that the new joinees of the past couple of days could uh, really uh, take their battle away from them. 
Definitely, but uh, what BJP feels is, and especially the central leadership feels that uh, uh, Delhi may not be a full uh, state. Uh, even uh, the political message for uh, uh, BJP will be very, very important, and and the reputation of Mr. Narendra Modi is at stake. Uh, if uh, if BJP uh, loses election in Delhi, then uh, it will be uh, it will be considered the, considered that uh, uh, Modi magic is not working anymore. So uh, BJP doesn't want to take any chance. And, and we have seen uh, in uh, in Lok Sabha elections also the way Mr. Amit Shah manages elections and the way he poaches uh, uh, leaders from other parties to win elections. And uh, in Delhi, central leadership has made it very very clear that uh, that uh, there is no uh, no scope uh, to uh, question central leadership's uh, uh, choices as far as Delhi elections are concerned. All right, we'll leave it for there now. Sham, thanks very much, Sham. Of course, we'll be keeping a track of that meeting, the Central Election Committee meeting of the BJP that is on to select the candidates for the Delhi Assembly polls. And uh, on to the Congress. Well, it was uh, a tough day for them because they had to deal with a high-profile defection from the party ranks. Former union minister in the UPA government, Krishna Tirath, joined the BJP. Just hours before the party is expected to release its list of candidates for the Delhi elections, that's scheduled on the 7th of February. A surprise induction for the BJP and a rude jolt for the Congress. Former UPA Minister Krishna Thirath met BJP Chief Amit Shah on Monday as a prelude to her joining the party. देखिए मन परिवर्तन नहीं मैंने कहा डिसिप्लिन जब खराब हुआ उस डिसिप्लिन को खराबी के कारण मुझे लगा कि जहां डिसिप्लिन है जहां अच्छी सोच है जहां जनता को आगे बढ़ने के लिए आज जनता के साथ काम करने का मुझे मौका मिलेगा इसलिए All the BJP leaders welcomed Thirath into the party fold. They themselves seem taken aback by the development. जिस क्षेत्र में आप रहती हैं, उस क्षेत्र में और उस वर्ग में और उन लोगों में निश्चित रूप से ये ताकत मजबूत होगी। हम भारतीय जनता पार्टी परिवार में श्रीमती कृष्णा तीरथ जी का जो वरिष्ठ नेता हैं, हार्दिक स्वागत करते हैं। अगर कृष्णा तीरथ जी पार्टी में शामिल हैं, हो रही हैं, तो स्वागत है। लीडरशिप नहीं इसलिए आ रहे हैं कृष्णा तीरथ जी अपने आप में बहुत ही एक सक्षम बहुत ही समझदार बहुत ही सीनियर एक वरिष्ठ कार्यकर्ता भी मंत्री भी रही हैं और उनके आने से और उनके तजुर्बे से बहुत ही फायदा मिलेगा मुझे लगता है और जितने अच्छे लोग आए एक जगह पे आए वो तो अच्छी बात तीरथ हैज बीन वन ऑफ द मोस्ट प्रोमिनेंट फेसेस ऑफ द कांग्रेस इन द नेशनल कैपिटल अ डिसीजन कम्स एज अ शॉक टू द पार्टी लीडर्स हु इंसिस्टेड दैट शी लेफ्ट आफ्टर बीइंग डिनाइड टिकट फॉर द स्टेट इलेक्शंस Thirath contested the national elections from Delhi last year and lost to BJP's Udit Raj. Jitra log lost their deposit in the last election. We could not provide the message. There is no other reason. Thirath is the latest in a series of public faces to join the BJP in the run-up to the Delhi elections. Last week, some well-known names associated with the Aam Aadmi Party movement, Kiran Bedi, Shahzia Ilmi and Vinod Kumar Binni joined the BJP. बिन्नी भाई हमारे को बहुत समय पहले एक साल पहले छोड़ के चले गए थे शाजिया जी छह महीने पहले छोड़ के गई थी किरण जी तो कभी हमारे साथ थी ही नहीं अब उसको अचानक पलायन कितने पेश किया जा रहा है मैं तो समझता नहीं कैसे होता है एक ही खबर को बार बार कैसे पेश किया जाता है तीरथ हैज बिन कांग्रेस लेजिस्लेटर एंड एम पी फ्रॉम डेली शी सर्व एज यूनियन मिनिस्टर स्टेट विद इंडिपेंडेंट चार्ज फॉर वुमेन एंड चाइल्ड डेवेलपमेंट इन द मनमोहन सिंह गवर्नमेंट ब्यूरो रिपोर्ट राज्यसभा टीवी and raising the political pitch ahead of the Delhi Assembly elections, the Congress today released a booklet highlighting U-turns taken by the Aam Aadmi Party Chief Arvind Kejriwal during his 49-day tenure as Delhi Chief Minister. The booklet cites 16 promises which were left unfulfilled by the former Delhi Chief Minister. The Congress also filed a complaint against Kejriwal to the Election Commission today for his comments at a rally on Sunday. Kejriwal had stirred a controversy by asking voters to take money from both the Congress and the BJP but vote for the AAP in the Delhi Assembly elections. कि अरविंद केजरीवाल जी जिस वक्त ये कहते हैं कि दिल्ली की जनता को कि वो कांग्रेस और भारतीय जनता पार्टी दोनों से पैसे ले लें तो वो एक ना केवल बहुत गैर जिम्मेदाराना बयान है वो ना केवल दिल्ली के लोगों का अपमान है बल्कि साथ साथ असंवैधानिक भी है लिहाजा मैं आपको बताना चाहता हूं कि हमारे लीगल डिपार्टमेंट ने 
इलेक्शन कमीशन को एक कंप्लेंट करा है Coming up on the other side, uh, Lankan Foreign Minister Mangala Samaravira meets Prime Minister Narendra Modi. More on that after the break. Welcome back. This is the news tonight. Now, ahead of the general budget next month, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley today said there was a need to rationalise all subsidies and increase public spending on infrastructure in the months to come. The government's subsidy bill towards oil and fertilisers runs into lakhs of crore rupees. Jaitley also underlined the need for stability in tax and other policies to make India an attractive place for investments. The centre has hinted that it will rationalise all subsidies soon. The government is expected to incorporate the suggestions of the Expenditure Finance Commission, headed by former RBI Governor Bimal Jalan, in the budget proposals for the next financial year. Jalan is reported to have submitted interim recommendations to the Finance Ministry, suggesting various steps to rationalise subsidies and public expenditure. From 1st January onwards, uh, the LPG subsidy goes into the bank accounts. The Expenditure Management Commission has made some interim suggestions. I am looking at them. And then you will have to gradually address the rationalization of all possible subsidies. He also said that the government will increase public spending on infrastructure in months to come. The government estimates the country needs to spend close to 5,000 crore rupees on infrastructure to grow 7% per annum sharply higher than around 5.5% projected by the RBI for the current fiscal year. Jaitley said that the public spending on infrastructure would have to increase because the old PPP model was under stress and needed to be revived. Where in months to come our uh, emphasis is going to be on far greater investment both domestic and international. We have to concentrate on manufacturing. We have to concentrate on infrastructure. Jaitley also underlined the need for stability in tax and other policies to make India an attractive place for investment. I've been struggling in the last few months to rationalize our taxation to make it as far as non-adversarial. Our effort is going to be to Make sure that as far as our tax structures, our budgetary processes are concerned, they are perfectly transparent. I do not favour the idea of uh, there being any concealed fiscal deficit. Jaitley had promised eminent changes, pushing ahead with key reforms such as the introduction of a nationwide sales tax. He said the implementation of the goods and services tax will help in improving the business climate in the country. Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. Well, time now for a focus story of the night. Uh, President Pranam Mukherjee today slammed the slew of ordinances brought in by the NDA government. He said the ordinance route cannot and should not be taken for normal legislation. The president's views assume significance in the context of the Modi government promulgating nine ordinances, including on the opening of the insurance sector to higher foreign investment and the land acquisition ordinance, this after parliament was par paralyzed in the winter session. He also criticised frequent disruptions in parliament, asking the ruling parties and the opposition to put their heads together to find out a workable solution. And we have with us a senior journalist, T.R. Ramachandran, in the studio with us to help us understand, uh, b b I mean, the, uh, the reason perhaps is quite obvious what we saw in the winter session and what we've been seeing often in our various parliament sessions. So the president putting out the message to both the government and the opposition parties that uh, let uh, parliament uh, conduct more business. You know, I believe, Ashish, that the president is a copybook president and he had made no bones about it when he assumed the high office. Let's also not forget that this president got 70% of the votes of the electoral college that elects a president. Mm -hmm. Last year, uh, addressing the nation or giving a message to the nation on the eve of Republic Day, he said two things I think which needs to be taken into account in the context of what he said today. The first is that this country needs a stable and strong government without which I think it would be heading for a disaster. Right. 
now that that has been fulfilled he has mentioned in his uh, uh, discussions on the topic of parliament and policy making mm. which is of great significance i think one of the aspects that he's drawn pointed attention to is the uh, is the temptation to you know promulgate ordinances a slew of them in particular Mm. especially when the government when parliament is not able to function mm. he has outlined three things in this context mm. the first is that the majority decision should stay and you cannot be taken hostage by a minority on the floor of the lok sabha by a patient majority mm -hmm. and the third aspect that he's pointed out is there has to be a consensus on issues and differences should not be expressed in a manner that uh, the lok sabha is disrupted time and time again mm. and he has given statistics to show how the first three lok sabhas performed compared to the 13th 14th and 15th lok sabhas right. and he has called upon the legislators to ensure that this kind of of disruptions is is not made into a habit and the time is not wasted along with the uh, scarce resources of the country there are several other aspects to his uh, right and i i want to touch upon the, uh, the, those uh, the, the other aspects uh, as far as uh, the the president mentioned during his uh, long address uh, and he was uh, addressing uh, iitns uh, uh, through video conferencing so another first for the president of india but having a political president i mean that was what was said about uh, the, the president pranab mukherjee because he was himself an outstanding parliamentarian during his uh, tenures so i mean uh, drawing upon that experience and expressing his uh, thoughts rather candidly well he he is an expert on parliamentary processes and procedures and he used to be the one person who used to constantly bail out the congress led upa whenever they found themselves in a jam i mean be that as it may i think the fact remains that as the first citizen he sees the duty on himself not only to be impartial and fair but also to ensure that the one doesn't go beyond the ambit of the constitution he has mentioned this several times in his uh, in his exchanges with the directors of higher education institutions of higher education the iits the nits and so on i think it's significant for several aspects because he's put in perspective how how does the the legislature the executive and the judiciary actually function and why is it that they should not come into conflict has has been evidenced lately that is why he has actually advocated for the parliament being conducted in a very orderly cooperative and understanding manner and it is anybody's right on the floor of parliament to any member's right rather to express dissent mm -hmm. but express dissent should not turn into disruption disorderly behavior and other things by which your house is adjourned mm. and i think one of the reasons that frustrated the ruling bjp led nda during the winter session in getting several of the key economic programs that it had in mind on the road is essentially because of the disruptions and disagreements mm. i think this particular sentence which he says that the minority on the floor of the house should not hijack a patient majority is very significant in other words mm. he is calling for consensus which can easily be evolved and on the other hand he is categoric that the majority view should be accepted in a parliamentary democracy all right indeed important words are from the pri uh, from the president and uh, but we'll have to wait and watch as to i think till the budget session of parliament to see how uh, the main political parties get into uh, the uh, budget session and whether they're able to resolve these long standing issues that we saw in the winter session as well thank you very much mr ramachandran for coming in thank you explaining us the nuances of what uh, the president of india had to say thanks so much Uh, moving on now uh, sri lankan foreign minister mangala samaravira who is on a 3 day visit to india met prime minister narendra modi today samaravira's talks with uh, modi were focused on strengthening bilateral ties the prime minister said he is hopeful that uh, with a serious sena coming to power peace and reconciliation will come to sri lanka he even appreciated the initial steps taken by the new government saying it is indicative of the direction they're taking The Sri Lanka government is reviewing Chinese infrastructure projects awarded under the previous administration. 
They will use independent audit firms to conduct the probe. Several Chinese leaders have lately, become, uh, have lately come under the scanner for graft charges in these projects. But China is unfacing. It is hopeful of further cooperation with Sri Lanka. China and Sri Lanka are good friends. The cooperation between the China and Sri Lanka is based on the cooperation and cooperation. This is an important basis. After days of speculation, Congress MP Shashi Tharoor's questioning began today. Tharoor reached the Vasant Vihar police campus for questioning late in the evening. Delhi Police Commissioner B.S. Passi had earlier said that all angles to the case are being probed. Shashi Tharoor's wife, Sananda Pushkar, was found dead in a hotel suite under mis mysterious circumstances. And let's get you all the other national news and updates in Nationwide. Public sector bank employees will go on a four-day strike from Wednesday over the long-pending wage revision issue. The decision is in response to the strike call given by the United Forum of Bank Unions, which is more than 10 lakh employees and officers of banking industry under its umbrella. Minimum temperatures at most places in Kashmir, including Ladakh, rose by around a degree. The Met Office has predicted rains or snow in the next few days. According to the Met Department, the temperature in Srinagar settled at minus 2.6 degrees. Uh, compared to minus 3.7 degrees the previous night. An encounter between security personnel and Mao has killed a rebel and injured one policeman on Sunday. A joint team of the CRPF and police acted upon receiving a tip-off. The injured police officer was admitted to hospital. The police also arrested two Maoists and recovered weapons. A minute cartoonist R.K. Lakshman was hospitalized in Pune after his health deteriorated suddenly on Sunday evening. Lakshman was suffering from a urinary infection and reportedly had a multi-organ failure. He is unconscious and on ventilator support. 14 people were arrested in Bihar's Muzaffarpur district for allegedly burning down a dozen houses on Sunday. At least three people were killed. A high-level probe has been ordered. Bihar Chief Minister Jitan Ram Manji cancelled a tour to Mumbai to be in Patna. Some international news now and expressing worries about the recent violence in the Ukrainian region of Donetsk, the, the European Union leaders say they are far from easing sanctions on Russia. The leaders are still to decide on arranging talks between the two warring sides after earlier peace attempts failed. Now, the attacks in Ukraine have been stepped up in the last week with more reports of casualties. European foreign ministers arriving in Brussels, even as Ukrainian government forces and rebels continue to battle for control in Ukraine. The ministers will discuss ways to improve Ukraine's position and focus on the bloc's policy towards Russia. And uh, in these days, uh, obviously, the coming back of violence in the east of Ukraine is definitely not good news. What we will discuss today is the ways in which the European Union tools, the instruments we have, apart from sanctions, can be used in a more coordinated way, in a more effective way. Any alleviation of the sanctions against Russia is only expected if concrete improvement is seen on the ground. But members say there's no reason for any policy change. I don't think that the uh, current mod modus operandi should be changed, current policy should be changed, or, or sanctions lifted, so there's no reason for that, no pretext even for that. Uh, the main thing what we'd like to see is political will from Russia to change something. Aber jedenfalls müssen wir in dieser Woche entscheiden, ob wir auf einem Weg in Richtung uh, Vorbereitung auf eines Gipfels sind oder nicht. Darüber hinaus uh, hat die hohe Repräsentantin Violence still rages in Donetsk for the control of the airport. Government troops claim they have recaptured almost all the territory of the airport in recent weeks. The site is already in ruins after months of intense clashes. The Kiev government and Russia accused each other of ignoring appeals for a ceasefire. Thousands marched in the capital Kiev calling for peace and to honour those killed in the conflict. President Poroshenko praised the soldiers and said Ukraine is united as never before and will guarantee them victory. More than 4,800 people have been killed since the rebels took control of regions in eastern Ukraine last April. Many more have been displaced by the fighting. Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. Time now for all the other international news and updates in Global Buzz. 
Diplomats have confirmed limited progress in the nuclear talks in Geneva between Iran and the world powers. Both sides are slated to meet next month. Iran and the P5 plus 1 group of nations, that's Britain, China, France, Russia and the United States and Germany, met for talks to limit Tehran's nuclear program in exchange for easing international sanctions. All sides agreed to step up efforts to reach a political understanding by the end of March while working towards a full-blown deal by their self-imposed deadline of the 30th of June. Yemen's capital Sana'a is in lockdown as heavy fighting is underway between troops of uh, and between troops and uh, Shia Houthi rebels uh, in and around the presidential palace. Prime Minister Khalid Baha's motorcade was also shot at but no one was hurt. At least two people have been killed and 14 wounded in the clashes that are posing to be the most serious challenge for the government. Indonesian investigators say they found no evidence to show that terrorism was involved in the crash of the Air Asia passenger jet that killed all 162 people on board last month. The team of 10 investigators at the National Transportation Safety Committee found no threats in the cockpit voice recorder to indicate foul play. The Airbus A32200 vanished from radar screens on the 28th of December, less than halfway into its two-hour flight from Surabaya to Singapore. And some sports now. The Australian Open began with expected results, even though there were some upsets on day one. Rafael Nadal, Roger Federer, Andy Murray and uh, Maria Sharapova made winning starts. But former French Open champion Anna Ivanovic was not so lucky and was ousted in the first round. Relief writ large on his face, former world number one Rafael Nadal romped his way into the second round of the Australian Open. Hoping to meet an out-of-form Nadal, Russian veteran Mikhail Yuzhny faced a tough test. The direction of third seed Nadal's comeback from illness and injury was evident in just a handful of games as the Spaniard eased into his Grand Slam groove before roaring to a 6-3, 6-2, 6-2 win in less than two hours. Roger Federer too strolled into the second round with a clinical 6-4, 6-2, 7-5 route of Taiwan's Liu Yen Shun under the lights on Rod Laver Arena. In ominous form, after winning the Brisbane International, the 33-year-old Swiss was impenetrable on serve. The 47th-ranked Liu battled hard to make the third set a contest, but lost serve in the 11th game before Federer sealed the match in less than two hours. The biggest upset of the day came when Czech doubles specialist Lucy Rodeka defeated former French Open champion Anna Ivanovic. The Serb looked out of sorts, playing 30 unforced errors. She lost the match 6-1, 3-6, 2-6. Maria Sharapova had an easy first round as she beat Petra Martic 6-4, 6-1. Sharapova took some time to find her groove in the first set as she took it 6-4 in 43 minutes. The five-time Grand Slam champion faced some staunch resistance in the second set too, but converted the crucial points when they mattered. Bidding for a maiden Australian Open title, after three trips to the final, sixth seed Andy Murray beat India's Yuki Bhambri 6-3, 6-4, The match had its anxious moments with the Scot hurting his knee early in the second set and falling 4-1 behind in the third. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, that's the news tonight. Good night.